Joel D, good evening. Yeah, we're along Cameron Street right now. Street being the operative word because it's looking a little bit more like a waterfront, if you ask me. And believe it or not, we're right now currently on the sidewalk. You can see this car actually going past the barricades, which you were just talking about how we're not supposed to be doing. And you can just see that water pooling around the car as they continue on past us. Just looking at some of the depth of this water. This is about three feet, I would say, close to it. It's about up to my hip length. And uh, you can see just how far it went underneath there. And just to give you some more perspective over here, you can see our car is parked. When we parked this about 30 minutes ago, the water was not up that far. But just coming down this way, when we were here for about two hours, excuse me, what? What was that? No, you can't. You really should be turning around. That's what PennDOT says. They advise you to turn around because you could get ticketed if you do this. All right. So, yep, you can see him. He, he's going to be backing up on this road instead of going straight forward just because you can see how deep that water is around him. He's reversing. Sir, you may want to be turning up this way. Um, because I'm not sure that he can get too far back with the truck there. But this is kind of the scene that we've been seeing all day long. The 17 year brood X cicadas are long gone, but the damage they left behind is still plain to see. You can see all of those dead branches on the trees. Now the larger, more mature trees can handle it, but it's these smaller trees that bear fruit that suffer more severe damage with obvious crop loss. Right here is where that Jeep drove off of this embankment and crashed down into the water behind me here. When authorities arrived to the scene, they say they found those two people dead inside the Jeep. This is where the home at 132 Neal Road once stood. A February fire consumed that home and it was torn down, but not before investigators discovered a violent crime. Did a love triangle lead to murder? And what happened to Jasmine Forbes? When I'm not reporting for CBS 21 News, one of my passions is soccer. Over the past 30 plus years, I have played and officiated on fields all across the country. Over the years, I've refereed thousands of games at the youth level, wearing the patch of the United States soccer. At the high school level, donning the stripes of the PIAA, running fields all across York and Adams counties. And most recently, refereeing in some of the biggest college conferences in all the country. But quite frankly, there's simply not enough of me, and the trend is now alarming. If there's a school shooting, the first few minutes are critical. Police say how good or bad their responses can determine the outcome of a situation. That's why today, walking these hallways at Steel High, we had a first-hand look, watching emergency responders practice stopping a threat and taking control of a scene, trying to protect as many people as possible if the real thing were to happen. sounding through the school. Help! Help! Where do we go? Help! 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 There's somebody injured! There's somebody injured! Help, and desperate please. cries for help. I've been shot! I've been shot! Hey, just stay here! Hey! Hey, you gotta help me! Come here! Don't leave! This active shooter simulation... That's fine. A frantic feeling, giving a glimpse of what could happen if there was a gunman. With the scenario starting, the response happened right away. Past the stairs, correct? Correct. Police running through hallways, injured students begging to be rescued. Help me, please. Help me, help me, please. Don't leave me here. Their first priority, stopping the shooter. Open the door. Open the door. One by one, clearing classrooms, taking control. It's open, it's open, going in. Then helping those who are hurt or who may have died once the scene is safe. While somebody is in there bleeding, we want to get them first aid as, as quickly as possible. So a Terra Township and Steelton Police, along with EMS and other responders, doing the drill together. And a lot of times we're actually closer in response than Spadara Township. So this is the great opportunity to, for both departments to come and work together. I think communication went very well. For Steelton High Spire Superintendent Mick is crick. School safety is, is on my mind at all times. Schools should be safe. They should be uh, spaces where kids are here to learn in a safe environment and having the support and working all together uh, is, is going to ensure that safety. As the school year starts. This should give some of the parents peace of mind 
saying that we are preparing for this, we are training for this. We're not going to do that right now, man. Keeping students and staff safe. I can't make a guarantee that we're never going to have a tragedy. I just know that, you know, practicing and preparing uh, is always the right thing to do. In Dauphin County, Jessica Babb, CBS 21 News. Of Miss Louise Barton Schlager and Mr. Claude Peter Schwartzbaugh Jr. We're taking you back 70 years to July 9th, 1952. Hello and welcome to Bride and Groom. The reality TV show out of New York City. Right, get to meet our lovely bride. She's Miss Louise Barton Slager. Her bridegroom is Mr. Claude Peter Schwartzbaugh Jr. 25-year-old Claude and 21-year-old Louise were getting married. And that was quite a brazen experience, I think, for a little farm girl right off the farm to the big city. The couple didn't have a lot of money. We wanted to get married worse than anything. But they had a plan. If we could get on this program, we would get a free wedding, we would get gifts, we would get a honeymoon, and everything would be fine. They applied. There's the telegrams. Yeah, here are the telegrams. And got the invite. Everything was live, live TV. Claude could not wear white. My gown was ivory. He wore glasses at the time. He could not wear glasses. And it was live, and if you made a mistake, oh well. No other ties are more tender, no other vows more sacred than those you now assume. And after the ceremony, the wedding presents. Set up. Well, the first one is a General Mills automatic toaster, and it's so easy to clean. I still have the iron and the toaster, and of course the silverware, which has gone through 69 years of use, looks like new. It does. It does, yes. Of course, the refrigerator didn't make it. That had to be replaced. They began married life, teaching in York, moved to Cumberland County, and ended up in Hershey. There, look at us there. Two smiling faces, two kids <laughs> have the world by the tail. Yep. Not knowing what's ahead. Now, 70 years later, oh, they're reliving that special day. I pronounce that they are husband and wife together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So what's their secret? staying married. Worked as a team and maybe we liked each other. Yeah. <laughs> that had something to do with it. <laughs> something like that. Reporting in Hershey, I'm Candace Galise, CBS 21 News. There's no way that these massive white cliffs over the Susquehanna River would have been created by some tiny insignificant operation. They really stick out, plain as day, especially as seen here on Skyview 21. I'm standing on the White Cliffs of Kanoi, situated right on the Susquehanna River, and this was the industrial waste created by the once booming town that was here. Actually, the booming town was right there, but has been abandoned, replaced by this very thick forest, and also Lots of poison ivy. Leaves of three, let them be. My photographer and I had to find a better entrance to the forgotten town of Bill Meyer. We found a much better path into the forest, into Bill Meyer, poison ivy free. Let's go. In the thickest part of the forest, you find crumbling walls and foundation. It's been here and basically been abandoned for the last 60 years. You're looking at what's left over of an old building. Could have been the general store, could have been the post office. This was clearly a car. And decades ago, I'm standing pretty much where the center of town likely was. Bill Meyer really got started at the beginning of the 1900s. Um, basically as a company town. And so um, there was a quarry that's just on the other side of the railroad tracks. That quarry now filled with water was the source of the old town's prosperity. The quarry that's right here in Kanoi Township is rich with dolomite and it's very good quality. Dolomite is a very powerful and durable heat resistant material used to make steel. And during World War I, the demand for it was huge. Bill Meyer produced very um, high quality carbonite rock. So it, they considered it Donegal dolomite. This Donegal dolomite ended up fueling the war machine here in the United States. In the 1940s, the demand for the material dropped significantly. By the 1950s, they had a skeleton crew of about 50 men still working here at the quarry and a handful of families who were unable to move because of financial reasons. All commercial operations ceased in the early 1960s. The town, now just a time capsule with its cliffs, weathered foundations, and quarry, telling the story of a different era. And when passing by those white cliffs on the Northwest Lancaster County River Trail, know that you're moving along what was once the main road through the forgotten town of Bill Meyer. Ed Russo, CBS 21 News.
Skyview 21 flying over the Harrisburg Mile. Skyview 21 showing you the aftermath. A small family inn blown to pieces in Lancaster County. I've seen how this was sitting on jacks, ready to be moved, but never saw one being moved.